The subject of today's session is, once again, the biblical holy day of Purim. And, of course, its corresponding book in the Bible, the Book of Esther. Now, we've had sessions in the past focusing upon the Book of Esther in celebration of this holy day. I'd like today to focus in particular upon the roots of Purim. The roots of Purim that bring us back much, much further into the Bible and give us an opportunity to glimpse something of a historical process. And of course, inevitably, most critically for us, we're not looking to learn history here, but rather what messages there are for us for today. So it is in that vein that the title of today's session speaks of the Amalek Agag Haman connection. And without any further ado, let's seek the roots of this connection in the story that we read in the book of Esther. In particular, with respect to that notable character in the story, Haman. Now, Haman, of course, appears repeatedly in the verses of the book of Esther. The first time that he appears by name is in chapter 3, verse 1. After these things, King Achashverosh promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. Now, this identification of Haman as the Agagite is one that appears on another four occasions in the book of Esther. That is, likewise, in chapter 3, verse 10, we read, And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And practically back to back, in chapter 8, we find Queen Esther referring to Haman in this manner. That is, in chapter 8, verse 3, she speaks of the mischief, the evil of Haman, the Agagite. And in verse 5, speaking of the letters devised, the thought of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. And finally, significant that just as the first example was the very first place in the book of Esther where Haman appears by name in chapter 3, verse 1. Also, the very last time that he appears in the book of Esther, in chapter 9, verse 24, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had schemed against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the poor, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. Again, Haman the Agagite. Which, of course, inevitably forces us to ask, what does it mean to be an Agagite? Well, recognizing that Agagite means of Agag, who is Agag? The truth is that Agag, as a name, appears in exactly two other passages in the Bible. It is the second of these passages that makes it most clear to us what the designation means. And that is in the first book of Samuel, in chapter 15, the first instance in which Agag is introduced is in chapter 15, verse 8, speaking about King Saul's battle against Amalek, and he, King Saul, took Agag 
the king of Amalek alive. So, of course, the manifest conclusion here is that Agad is the name of the king of Amalek. Now, he wasn't supposed to take him alive, and that cost King Saul dearly. For our purposes at present, we'll simply focus on this being, the meaning of Agad, king of Amalek. We encounter the name Agad, as I already noted. In one additional passage in the Bible, this in the prophecy of Bil'am, in Numbers chapter 24, verse 7. Where we read in Bil'am's undesired, unsolicited praise of Israel, he shall pour the water out of his buckets, moistening his seed plentifully, and his king, king of Israel, will be higher than a god, and his kingdom will be exalted. His king will be higher than a god. As practically all of the Bible scholars note, this is obviously a reference to the battle of Israel against Agag and his people, Agag Amalek, that we read in the first book of Samuel in chapter 15. What the reference to Agag raises is an interesting question. Obviously, the Agag who did battle with King Saul was only to be born centuries later. The reference to Agad here, then, could be understood in either of two ways. That is, either we understand it as false prophecy. Prophecy, obviously, can make known to us things that might only otherwise be revealed centuries later. And we have examples of that sort of thing. That is, when one considers in the reign of Yerav'am and Rechav'am, one generation after King Solomon, that a prophet comes by way of rebuke of Yerav'am, Jeroboam, and his paganizing tendencies in the first book of Kings, in chapter 13, in verse 2, we read that this prophet, this man of God, came from Judah, and he cried against the altar by the word of God and said, O altar, altar, thus says God, behold, a child will be born to the house of David, and Yoshiah, Josiah, will be his name. And upon you, shall he slay the priests of the high places that burn incense upon you. That is, the pagan offerings. And Yoshiao, Josiah, again, is only born centuries later. So, how does the man of God know his name? Of course, the answer is obvious. Because he's a prophet. God told him. And indeed, in much the same vein, we'll note that in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, we read, Thus says God to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, that I may subdue nations before him. Cyrus? Cyrus, king of Persia. Again, centuries after Isaiah. So it certainly is possible for a prophet to prophesy regarding someone who will only actually come upon the stage of history centuries later. And Bil'am's referring to Agag could be understood that way. It's certainly possible. Of course, simultaneously, 
there is another possibility, and that is that we do find there are certain names, maybe call them titles, of kings of various peoples in the ancient world as preserved in the Bible. That is, as we well know, all of the kings of Egypt were called Pharaoh. We also see in the Bible that all the kings of Gerar are called Avimelech. We might note, likewise, that the king of Shalem, also known as Jerusalem, is Malkitzedek in the time of Abraham, Adonitzedek in the time of Joshua, which also seems like a consistent name or title. Because Malkitzedek, my king, is righteousness. Adonitzedek, my lord, is righteousness. Mean roughly the same thing. So, could very well be that Agag was a generic name of all Amaleki kings. Which, of course, is an interesting compliment to the observation that Haman is called the Agagrit, descended from Agag. Haman is Amalek, the royal lineage. So inevitably, in order to understand the story of Haman, it's not enough for us only to know the story of Agag, we really need to know the story of Amalek. And in considering that story, we'll know first, the first place where Amalek as a nation makes its debut in the Bible. And that is in Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 8. After the Exodus, after the splitting of the sea, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And what follows? Moses said to Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek to battle with them and the end of the narrative in verse 13, and Joshua Harry weakened Amalek and his people by the edge of the sword. This was the first encounter with Amalek. But we should note that it is by no means the last. And truth be told, all these encounters are frankly negative. That is, we read about Amalek once again in Numbers chapter 14, verse 45. The context here, after the sin of the spies, after God decreed upon Israel that they were to remain in the wilderness for 40 years as punishment for the sin of the spies, there were those who decided they are going up anyway, as if you could outsmart God's decree. And we read in Numbers chapter 14, verse 45, that after they presumed to go up to the hilltop to enter the land of Israel by force, then the Amalek, Amalekites, came down, and the Canaanites who dwelt in the hill and smote them and discomfited them as far as Korma. Second encounter with Amalek. We'll note also another couple of encounters with Amalek that take place in the Book of Judges. That is, in the Book of Judges, in chapter 3, verse 13, although the principal instigator against Israel at this time is the nation of Moab under the leadership of their king, Eglon, we still read that Eglon gathered in the children of Ammon and Amalek. So they were also part of the battle. And once again, in 
the time of the judge Gid'on Amalek is implicated in the despoiling of Israel in Judges chapter 6 verse 3 and in that final showdown with Gid'on's very small army we read that Midian and Amalek and all the children of the East lay along in the valley like locusts from multitude ready to do battle with Gidon and his very small folks. So Amalek is there again. Amalek, always there it seems, on the side that is our adversaries. And yet, while we have all these various encounters, there's only one encounter that is really central and historically significant. And that is the first. The one of which we read in Exodus chapter 17. Because it is concerning that encounter that we read in Deuteronomy in chapter 25 in verse 17 remember what Amalek did to you by the way when you were come out of Egypt remember remembering the Zachor in Hebrew often carries the specific connotation of verbalizing something, saying it. And that is indeed by our tradition the meaning here. And every year, besides reading this mandate to remember what Amalek did as part of the annual cycle of reading the entire Torah, all the five books of Moses, we also every year in synagogues throughout the world, read these verses, verses 17, 18, and 19, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, in order to remember. We do so, not at all incidentally, on the Sabbath, the Shabbat, immediately before the holiday of the Purim. As a result, remember, that remember in Hebrew is Zachor. This Sabbath is known as Shabbat Zachor. The Sabbath of remember. So, again, remember what Amalek did to you, by the way, when you were come out of Egypt. Verse 18, how he met you, by the way, and smote the hindmost of you, all who were feeble in your rear when you were faint and weary, and he feared not God. And you may be on some plane, we can readily appreciate why it is specifically that encounter that is the object of this remembrance. All the other encounters, we understand we're in the context of battle, altercation, adversaries in the geopolitical scene. This wasn't. This was unprovoked. This was completely from one side coming and doing battle without any cause for belligerence. Remember. And this mandate to remember culminates in action in verse 19 therefore it shall be when God your Lord has given you rest from all your enemies round about in the land that God your Lord gives you for an inheritance to possess it that you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven you shall not forget. Blot out, eradicate, obliterate. In the Hebrew, machon 
simcha to utterly erase. And it's important for us to appreciate this is actualized. It's actualized once Israel is indeed given rest. Once Israel has a king, and it's the first king, is King Saul. We first read in the military exploits of King Saul, in the first book of Samuel, in chapter 14, verse 48, that King Saul gathered a host and smote Amalek and delivered Israel out of the hands of them that spoiled them. Amalek is described here as among the first enemies. And far more deliberately and explicitly by divine command in chapter 15. We've already noted the first book of Samuel, chapter 15. That battle of King Saul and Israel against Amalek is instigated explicitly by the prophet Samuel. Chapter 15, verse 2, Thus says the God of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. I should note here, I think it's important for us to appreciate, and we've discussed this in the past, that our human evaluation of judgment is obviously not necessarily that of God. We do recognize that there is much in the Bible that teaches us in a manner that conforms to our innate sense of morality. And of course, ultimately, we believe that both the Bible and that innate sense of morality come from the same source, in God. But they are at times not compatible with one another. This is one such time. That is, we may not ourselves agree with the deliberateness and the scope of divine punishment, but this is divine punishment. It will indeed embrace all of Amalek. It's not what we regard as morality, it is God's word. So this is the actualization then of the mandate that we read in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 19, utterly blot out. We should stress though that this is, even though it was actually a very different message that came at the conclusion of that first battle with Amalek back in Exodus chapter 17, after the battle is over, in Exodus chapter 17, in verse 14, we read, And God said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. And Moses built an altar, and he called the name of the altar, God is my banner, for he said, because God has sworn by his throne that God will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So, which is it? Is it God's battle or our battle? Is it God's war ongoing with Amalek or our own? Remember, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 19, it was, you shall utterly blot out Amalek. In the Hebrew, macho timche. Macho timche is second person. You do this. Here, in Exodus chapter 17, Verse 14, it's almost the exact same expression. Macho 
in the difference is that this is first person. God says, I shall blot out Amalek. And of course, inevitably, this realization brings us to the first critical lesson that we need to learn from this story. Now, I admit, this is a lesson that we've already had many occasions to learn. But it's always important to stress this. God does say, I shall utterly blot out. But that doesn't contradict him telling us to utterly blot out Amalek. On the contrary. In Exodus chapter 17, God is stating what his plan is, what the goal is. How is that goal to be actualized? God summons us to be his junior partners. This is not an example of a pleasant partnership. This is not a mission that we accept upon ourselves glibly. But this is a mission that God gives us in advancing the world toward its ultimate goals and bringing the world to its final completeness. This is a critical element. And while it's explicitly part of God's plan, that doesn't mean that we should just be passive and wait for God to take care of it. He tells us, you take care of it. It's a mission that I'm imposing upon you. That's, of course, critical. Lesson number one. But now, in order to really appreciate what's going on, beyond, of course, the fact that Amalek was the first nation to do battle with Israel and to do battle unprovoked, gratuitously with Israel, to really understand what's going on, we need to dig even more deeply for roots. Because, you know, while I stated, truthfully, that Exodus chapter 17 is the debut of Amalek as a nation, the first place that Amalek as a nation appears in Scripture, it's not the first place that Amalek appears in Scripture. We need to ask ourselves, whence Amalek? From where does this nation come? And that necessarily brings us So a consideration of Genesis chapter 36. In Genesis chapter 36, in verse 16, we read of the various chiefs that descend from Esau, Jacob's brother. And on that list, we read the chief Amalek. So Amalek is one of the chiefs of Esau. Okay. When did he come? What was the source of this name, this chief, altogether? And that inevitably pushes us another four verses back. Where we read in Genesis chapter 36, verse 12, and Timnah was a concubine to Eliphaz, son of Esau. And she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. Okay, in order to really appreciate who Amalek is, we need to consider who Timna, his mother, is. And to answer this question, we consider also in Genesis chapter 36 the additional genealogy beyond the genealogy of the household of Esau that the Torah gives us beginning in verse 20 the genealogy of Seir the Chori, the Chorian and in this genealogy the sons of Seir the indigenous inhabitants of the land that ultimately become absorbed into the emergent nation of Esau. 
Edom. We read specifically in verse 22, and the children of Lotan, Lotan being one of the sons of Seir, in other words, a prince of great consequence, the children of Lotan were Kori and Imam, and Lotan's sister was Timna, Jane Timna, which means, obviously, that if Lotan is being described as one of the princes of the Seir, Timna was a princess. Now, that seems kind of strange, if you think about it, because, generally speaking, concubines were not from the highest social strata of society. What's Princess Timna doing being concubine of Eliphaz, the son of Esau? So I have to concede, if you look for an answer to this question in the Bible, you won't find it. It's just left as a kind of dangling mystery. But we have a tradition, an ancient tradition, a tradition that, truth be told, is a tradition of truth. That this Pina, this royal princess, wanted to integrate herself into the household of Abraham at all costs. She sensed something holy, something godly, something spiritual. She wanted to become part of that household. And Abraham didn't accept it. And she tried with Isaac. And Isaac didn't accept it. And Jacob didn't accept it. You know, we could perhaps argue in their defense that someone who ends up being mother of Amalek may have a certain very deeply rooted character flaws. Could be. But Tina, in her uncompromising perseverance to become part of this blessed household, then offers herself as concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And, of course, inevitably, the message of this tradition is, and look what happens, that from that union emerges this nation, Amalek, that has been so implacably our enemy seems forever. A warning. Never allow the outward appearances to sway you from trying to hold out your hand to anyone who is attempting to seize it in a positive way. So, the story of Tina is a story of thinly veiled rebuke of our holy patriarchs and message, of course, inevitably, on that plane to all of us. But there's an additional dimension that I feel compelled to stress here, and that is when you consider the message in that vein, this message of rebuke, it's not. It never should be construed as being a racial question. That is, if anything, on the contrary. In the prophecy of Ovadia, now the prophecy of Ovadia in the 12 minor prophets is just one chapter long. We read words of severe rebuke and chastisement of the house of Esau. In verse 18, and the house of Jacob will be fire, and the house of Joseph, flame, and the house of Esau, stubble. 
and they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining in the house of Esau, for God has spoken it. So, of course, on the one hand, the prophecy of relentless divine retribution sounds kind of like the mandate to utterly block out, blot out Amalek and all that pertains to Amalek. And yet simultaneously, I feel compelled to share with you an emphasis in our tradition with respect to this verse. Why there is the particular emphasis, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. We already know we're talking about the house of Esau. The house of Esau was the stubble, right? That is only speaking of those who act like they're part of the house of Esau. It doesn't apply to everyone. There were very righteous people who were descended from the house of Esau. And as an operative mandate with respect to God's command to utterly blot out Amalek that only pertains if Amalek is continuing to behave in the lawless, godless, pagan manner that Amalek did. But if Amalek takes upon itself individuals of Amalek, even the entire nation. God's covenant with Noah and all of Noah's descendants, the seven Noah had laws, they're not Amalek anymore. They can still talk about a national identity. That doesn't matter. The divine command to blot out Amalek will have then been accomplished by Amalek. By Amalek ceasing to be Amalek, by them becoming righteous Gentiles. That's enough of a basis for them to be saved, for them to be saved in this world, and then to be saved in the hereafter. It has nothing to do simply with ethnicity. It's important for us to stress that. And that, of course, inevitably is an additional critical lesson here. It's not racial. It's ideological. It is, then, what Amalek signifies. And that brings us to a still deeper level of understanding of what's taking place here. Returning to the prophecy of Yu'am that we mentioned earlier, it's a different prophecy, but it's in the same chapter, Numbers chapter 24 in verse 20. In this passage, Bil'am is gazing out upon the nations of the world and reporting their future fate to Bala is none too happy host in Moab. And he says, when he looked out on Amalek, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be everlasting destruction. What does it mean to refer to Amalek as the first of nations? Obviously, Amalek was not the first nation to come into existence. There were certainly nations before Eliphaz fathered Amalek. So what does being the first of nations mean here? There's one very obvious answer to the question. The obvious answer to the question is, well, Amalek was the first nation, the first of nations to attack Israel following the glorious miracles of the Exodus, the splitting of the sea, when God's presence in Israel's midst was so obvious. So, beyond ignoring 
you think no one would attempt to touch them because it was obvious that doing battle with Israel is doing battle with God. Amalek is the first. Because Amalek is doing battle with God. And that brings us to perhaps a deeper level of understanding of what being the first of nations may signify. Amalek strikes very deeply at the roots, the roots of all this world, the roots of everything that we're supposed to be doing here. You know, Haman's name, and you can see it spelled here in the verse that's quoted before you, is spelled in Hebrew, Hey Mem Nun. Well, the same letters, Hey Mem Nun, accompanied by a different set of vowels, is the word Ha Nun. It's a question. It's a question of Ha Nun, as in have you of, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you shouldn't eat? Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. God's reproach. The first man and first woman have committed the first sin. Evil has come into the world. And in a kind of veiled sense, when evil comes into the world, those words of God's rebuke invoke the legacy of Amalek, Agad, Him. Now, obviously, again, this shouldn't be understood in any kind of a literal sense. But we have an ancient tradition connecting these verses that on a deeper plane what Amalek signifies and by extension I'm not in is the root of people in the world. And so Amalek is the first of nations in the sense that, before they were even nations, this identity, this representation, evil, or really one, as a challenge, as a summons, what are we going to do about it? And so, to that extent, we consider yet an additional lesson that emerges from this Amalek Agag Haman connection. There is evil in the world. There is evil in the world, and there is evil in each and every one of us. And of course, to that extent, part of our doing battle with Amalek is an inner battle, an inner conflict, recognizing these forces of evil within ourselves, embedded in the world from that initial divine summons. Did you eat of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The tree of knowing good and evil? That challenge that summons. We've noted in the past, I'm going to stress this point, what God says to Adam and to Eve is not a curse. There's only one of the trio of accomplices who is cursed in Genesis chapter 3, and that's snake. Adam and Eve aren't cursed, but they are changed as a result of what they did. 
There is evil in the world. And we need to come to terms with it. And that battle, that battle with Amalek, is also an internal battle with those forces of evil. But that brings us to an even more sublime and maybe more critical lesson to consider as well. And that returns us to one of the verses that we noted at the very outset in the book of Esther, in chapter 3, verse 10. This was, you may recall, one of those instances in which Haman is explicitly identified as an Agagite. And what was the context? The context was, and the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. What's my point? Well, another ancient tradition, we've noted this in the past, in the book of Esther, God's name never explicitly appears, not even once, but not explicitly, implicitly. Whenever we encounter the king, we see it as a subtle hint, an allusion to the king, the king, the supreme king, the king of kings, God. Now let's consider reading the book of Esther through these spectacles. What we're reading in chapter 3, verse 10. The king, the real king, takes his ring from his hand and gives it to him. Astonishing. Terrifying. But there's a message here. Because those forces of evil need not be evil. On the contrary, we're supposed to try to integrate them in the way we serve God and bring them back to God. So yes, God empowers Haman. He does, after all. That's what happens in the story. But ultimately, that should be a summons to take the forces of evil and vacate them to God. You know, there is one additional verse, and that's the verse that you see in front of you here, that maybe makes this point even more explicit. The words of Esther in chapter 5, verse 4. If it seems good to the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I prepared for him. Well, you know, I just noted that God's holy name never appears in the book of Esther, the only book of the Bible like that. Never appears as the actual four-letter name of God. But in initials, Yud, followed by He, followed by Vav, followed by He. The initials of these four words spell the tetragrammaton, God's holy name. Now, of course, inevitably, we need to ask ourselves, so what does that mean? What does it signify? And the truth is, there's obviously no easy answer to what that signifies in this deeper sense. But on some plane, when we speak of let the king and Haman come today, that's the closest we get to a veiled reference to God's holy name in the book of Esther. We can appreciate that the king coming is a thinly veiled reference to God, but the king coming with Amen? The answer, of course, inevitably is. That today, in our world, the king comes with him. The forces of evil all inevitably need to be subordinated to God. 
we recognize, as expressed in Isaiah, that God, after all, is the one who forms light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates evil. There's no other source. Everything comes from God. And blessing you. Most critically is, it's up to us to bring everything back to God. This is part of the plan. And if we ask how this plan ultimately gets most forcefully actualized, one additional verse from the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, in chapter 5, verse 11, the context is Haman, wicked and pretentious, boasting. Haman recounted to them, to his friends, the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children. He's so proud. But you know, with respect to the most good of him and children, this is really deep. We have an ancient tradition. It's a historic tradition. That from among the descendants of him, there were those who were studying the Torah and teaching it here, in the land of Israel, in the city of B'nai Bra, somewhat west of you. What does that mean? Well, of course, first of all, on the most obvious way, it means that none of this has anything to do with race, because on the contrary, it's still from the race of Amalek, but it doesn't matter, they're not Amalek anymore. They're studying the Torah. They're teaching the Torah. They're connected with God. But it's more than that, much deeper than that. Amalek, Agag, Haman really do signify worldly greatness. Great power, great strength, great accomplishments. Not in a good sense, of course. Rather, on the contrary, in dedicating those accomplishments to their battle with God and his people. That's still great power. That great power ultimately needs to be brought home. Restore the forces of godliness. So Haman is boasting about his children and he doesn't even realize what he really has to boast about in the end that his children are going to end up on the other side, on the side of goodness, on the side of godliness, on the side of taking everything that he himself signifies and restoring it to its divine source. Of course, ultimately, taking everything, even evil, as means to serving God. Subordinating everything to the forces of good and God is the greatest blessing of all. So when we consider at greatest depth what the underlying meaning of this root, again, the Amalek Adad Haman connection is. What is it telling us? What is teaching us? It, of course, is teaching us something that is far, far beyond the specifics of Amalek and Naga and Haim. It's teaching us something about ourselves, about our mission. Each and every one of us undoubtedly centers on manifold things, a dark side in ourselves. And we might think that the best thing we could do is destroy it, mutilate it, cut it off. That's a terrible tragedy. 
it is there. It's there. In the return of the God. There can be no greater blessing than that. May we indeed have the wisdom, the dedication, the perseverance to do just that. To bring all the evil back. Serve God. Love God. Accomplish his name in the world. God bless you.